this is Pat Lawless. He's the only Irish skipper in the 2022 Golden Globe race and we're aboard his boat, the Saltram Saga 36 Green Rebel. Pat, just tell me briefly, why did you decide to choose this boat for the GGR? Ooh, when I decided to enter the GGR, it took me six months to pick a boat and I looked and looked and looked and I was offered several boats or I had choices of several boats and I inquired and I got a very good offer in a little 34, really. The, the, the owner wanted in the race, it was just a steal takeaway, but I decided if you're going to do it, you want the best boat you can have, and a little 34 is a great boat, but I think this is way ahead of it. I picked it for a couple of reasons, the canoe stern, for safety in storms downwind, uh, waves won't be catching a transom and pushing it, small cockpit, much safer, and small portholes, and very heavy displacement with a very low centre of gravity, a shorter mast than like this boat is two tons heavier than the Rustler and a much shorter mast. So I picked it for safety and a 36 foot boat rather than a 32 foot boat or, you know, 32, 36 is the rule. So, so yeah, and I'm delighted with it. It's faster than I expected, I was wondering. It's not very fast upwind. The Rustlers are faster, they have a, a sharper bow and they, they cut through the waves whereas I'm inclined to pitch and the waves slow me down, but there's trade-offs now and I'm faster downwind, I believe. And you, of course, your background fishing off Ireland and um, kind of up into Icelandic region, you have experience of kind of heavy weather. Yeah, um, when, I, when I was young, I sailed a lot, including races to the Canaries as far south as I went and around Ireland and things like that and club racing and a lot of dinghy racing when I was young. I started off mirrors, then lasers, then four, or then 420s, then lasers and so... Yeah, so I had a lot of sailing experience in my youth and actually following the Austars was what inspired me to, I'd like to go solo sailing. And then it was later after the, the finish of the Golden Globe race that I kind of found that and I was about 12 then. As a fisherman, I spent a lot of time off the west coast of Ireland in, during the winters and sitting in the wheelhouse, you'd be looking out and you see heavy weather. I had one boat to the, the bill gets you was 126 foot you'd fish in her regardless of weather more or less you know so i was out in one hurricane in her in rockall which are 380 miles away from land so you're kind of conscious of the crew would be safe and everything like that so you would be watching the weather closely and that was pre weather fac facts are weather routing or like that you were just studying the weather and so for she you, was, so for you the heavy weather of southern ocean storms is not something that you're well, obviously you're concerned about, but you feel like as prepared as you can be. I do. I don't fear the Southern Ocean at all. I know you need a bit of luck not to get badly hit with a rogue wave and storms and things like that. But I fear the doldrums and the, the calms. My father sailed around the world and he struggled in the doldrums. He said like it was the hardest, mentally, and heat and everything. So, so I have to get through the doldrums first and then face the Southern Ocean. Going into Cape Town will be a pain. But we have to do it. We all have to do it. And a lot of luck there. Can you get in and out quick? That's so, yeah. Yeah, because of course you've got the Agulhas current there and um, kind of Cape Doctors could hamper you quite badly. Yeah, yeah. So you need good navigation, you need luck. Yeah, so that, that'll be the one. Make sure that you're far enough east before you turn north and don't try and cut the corners and you get swept up past Robin Island and all that. So, yeah. Just keep an eye on it. What do you think gives you an edge in this race? Oh, I don't know. Do I have an edge? <laughs> like, um, we're all companions. All the entrants are companions. And I don't really consider I have an edge. Anyone has an edge. Um, maybe we have the look of the Irish. That'll be my edge. I don't, I don't <laughs> know. And um, just talk me through what you did to the boat when you got her to make her ready for the race. She was in very good condition. I did the bulkhead up in the bow like we have to do. And I put in a lot of hand grips and I put in all this um, all this partition and that. So it's it's a structural thing. So that they, they will take an impact down. It was all open right through. So And I put in all, all those extra hand grips up and down and their structural support as well. 
and also give you some protection in case you get a bit of a wave coming down below. Yeah, I'll have a scupper to go across here and that will stop the water. I'll try and keep this area dry. I put in the fire. Yes, yeah, so you're the only one with a fire, I notice. Am I, yeah. Well, that's because you come from a nice cold country like Ireland. <laughs> And the fire is fantastic. It's really, it's a comfort thing. You, you wouldn't dry out the body. I'd have enough for a fire once a week in the Southern Ocean. You could sit down and have a nice meal and light the fire and relax if the conditions were suitable. If the wind is against me, I can't light the fire. It's inclined to smoke. If the wind is behind me, no problem. It's as the, it's the wind against you is fine. It's as it cuts through the waves, sometimes it, it, it just causes smoke, so. And obviously, um, obviously, well, before getting your green card to be good to go, you kind of, there was a small issue with your celestial navigation, so you had to go out and do an extra 300 miles just to prove that you could do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which was nice. The, the sail was nice, and here's my green card. <laughs> You're good to go. You get better bus tickets, but it's a green card. <laughs> um, do you feel confident with your celestial navigation? Oh, yeah, yeah. And I did before I went out. There was no problem. I just had to, to do it. Yeah. To prove it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and... How do you think you fare amongst the rest of the fleet? I would pick entrance that I would consider really good. And I'd put about five into that bracket. And I'd pick some that I'd wonder, would there be finishers? And I'm not going to say who's who in anyone, because you need luck. And I just look at the prep of the boats and that. and. I see some are really well prepared and I wouldn't have bought Puffin, a uh, trade wind, I just personal thing like, but Ian made a great job of that boat, you know, really well, really well. I wouldn't have changed the mast on it if it was my boat, I might have done work on it. The old mast was way bigger, but like it's well rigged, you know, in fairness to him. And yeah, and Kristen's boat, I like Kristen's boat, it wasn't on my radar when I was shopping and it's a powerful boat, it's by far the fastest boat. Now, the difference in speed in the boats might be three to five miles a day on average over the whole race. So it's really not about the boat so much, it's about finding the wind to get you going. Like, you know, if you find the wind, you'll be, you'll be way faster. So, yeah, but it's still nice to have a good solid boat. Kristen's boat, I would reckon, is the, the best boat for the race. And um, talk to me about your sail plan and kind of your storm tactics. I was lucky, I, when, I, when I bought the boat, I'm out at racing, I had been cruising, I had been fishing and sailing, cruising and for years and I wouldn't be up to speed on the best racing sails. So I emailed six different lofts, three in Ireland and three abroad and about a year ago Rolly Tasker came back with a fantastic deal and they, prior to that they had given me the best advice. They, they really got on board and the sails that were on the boat, the old sails, they were Rolly Tasker sails as well. And they gave me a great deal. And then a company in Waterford, a global company, the FLI Group, they sponsored my sales. So they paid and imported them and cleared them through customs and everything for me. So that was a huge good day that was, you know. <laughs> uh, and um, so I'm gone with a mainsail with four reefs. And the top fit is stronger. I have three reefs with reefing lines. And the last reef, if I need it, I will have to go to the mast to reef it. And it's just the ropes would be up so high and extra ropes coming back. I decided that was the way to go. My stay sail is standard stay sail and the storm sail can go under. So that's three sails. Then I have three jibs. I have two on now, 140% uh, Genoa and uh, number two, which would be about, but it's a Yankee cut, would be about 110%. And then I have one other Yankee, if I take off to Genoa and put it on, it's, it's a number three and that can go on in front if you see bad weather coming and you want two jibs or running downwind even only out a little bit or whatever, but you just have the option of a smaller. And then I have four spinnakers, two symmetrical and two asymmetrical. So it's, compre That's ten. it's comprehensive, it's ten, yeah, 10 sails, which is the maximum allowed, isn't it, for, yeah, yeah. Um, for your type of boat. Um, so, I guess you wanted as many kind of different options as possible for the weather that you'd come across. Yeah, with the uh, with, uh, twin jibs running downwind with the 140% Genoa and uh, the Yankee, the number two, I can pull them out and sail downwind as easy as 
a, a small asymmetrical spinnaker. And if you pull one out of the weather, she goes well. She's very balanced with the twin jibs. Um, so if you pull the number two out of the weather, like she has power. She's she's good to go far, rather than a spinnaker that can cause trouble. But lighter winds, I have a big hundred square meter spinnaker, lovely green, white, and gold one, with green rebel written into it. So it's, it's a nice spinnaker, yeah, and. So yeah, that's the sails. It's it's simple, straightforward. But the twin jibs in front and the stay sail, you wouldn't expect it. But the stay sail gives you an extra knot going to wind, going to weather in light. It just makes the airflow over the main sail better. And you'd think it would be killing the slot, but it doesn't. It it actually helps a lot. And of course, um, this is not only a race for you, but I'm guessing you're aiming to be the first Irishman to complete a non-stop solo circumnavigation well, in the world. If I can do it, the first race had Bill King and Commander Bill King, who was a, an unbelievable man. My brother met him. He, he lived in a castle up in Galway. He called the boat Galway Blazer after the local hounds that went hunting. And the second race had Gregor McGuckin. So we have unfinished business. <laughs> so it'd be nice to do it. Be lovely to do it, yeah, and third time lucky. Good luck. Thank you, Katie, thank you. Can you show us around the boat? Yeah. So this is a painting my mother did for me. Oh, wow. And she did one for my father when he sailed around the world. So it's nice. So, so your personal. little good luck to her yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, because your father, your father also named Pat, sailed around the world with stops. With Pat, stops, yeah. How many yeah. stops did he do on his? Oh, Cape Town. Uh, Albany Bluff. Then he damaged his. He lost a, a spreader, and he put out spinnaker booms, kind of a jury rig. And he took his time and sailed to Valparaiso. And then he went through Valparaiso. Or after Valparaiso, it was too late to go around Cape Horn, so he went through the Panama Canal and home back to Ireland. Yeah. So I started about four or five stops or six maybe. Yeah. So it's almost like a lawless family unfinished business <laughs> as opposed to a national unfinished business. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so up front, obviously, you've got your bulkhead there and uh, your sails. Yeah, I put in two poles for tying ropes onto. Okay. These are just to play with off the, the, the bunks and uh, not that we're here. These two orange things here, they're um, covers in case I damage any of these hatches and they fit over them. And because my cabin top is epoxy play with, I can just screw screw them down on to, if I need to put them on. Okay, and so you've really thought about if you get rolled and they crack or, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these are my spinnakers. There's one, two, three, another one up there, four. This one isn't properly begged yet. So, the boat is a mess now because my wife just went shopping and I asked for 20 tins and I bet you it's 30 or 40 just in case I go hungry, so. Oh, oh yes, look, you've got some pledge there. I think you must be the only uh, skipper with some pledge on board to keep his woodwork shiny. Well, I don't know <laughs> will I bring it with me when I leave, but yeah, it's nice to keep the boat fresh for, you know, for yourself, for cleanliness and yeah, keep away the fungus. So you've obviously got some um, two weather faxes here, one here and one here. Yeah, I got this off a of fisherman in Dingle. This is a, a tuner to help pull in the signal, and I bought this off Guy de Boer, the American. So, hopefully they will work all the way around on that, yeah. I have some carvings I did. Yeah. This is an inclinometer, and hopefully it won't go up that way during <laughs> the race. Ni feder an gwe a haru, akis feder na shorta a haru. You can't alter the wind, but you can adjust your sails. So it's Irish, where I live, we speak Irish. Um, <laughs> and this is my favourite. Oh, here we go, food is nice. That will keep you motivated. And obviously you can really see this kind of high spec screen here, which yeah. divides the, the galley from, from the saloon. I put these in for structural reasons to support, if you've got a bad lump of waterfall down top here, a, a pitch pole, and it structurally supports, and these structurally support the boat. But it, it worked out very well. I didn't want closed feeling. I wanted an open feeling, so I just put in the perspex there. And these all these organisers all help with, with all that. And obviously you've got your nav station here with your radios. Yeah, since I put in this table, all my navigation is done at this table here, the main table. I never sit in here anymore. And I used to, and I put this locker in especially for my feet. So that when I was sitting there, I could... Um, be comfy. Put, yeah, and that, but anyway, that's the way it is now. And this this is my radio receiver. It's just a receiver, it's not a transceiver. Yeah, I'm worried about 
what will happen. So that's BBC Four. And it's good. It works like I can pick up all the time signals yeah. and everything. Radio Direction Finder. This is my SSB. And um, uh, two one eight two. So. Um, yeah, so I have, the, the electrics are simple, this is my AIS alarm, if I, if a boat comes along, this, this alarm goes off, and this is the Echo Max, if a radar comes along, it will bleep to tell you there's, to tell you there's a radar around, so my that's my AIS transponder, which actually went around the boat, around the world in a different Irish boat, the uh, Green Dragon, and it's a really good Class A one. And when there's a, another, there's, when it goes green down here, the green light tells you that it's sending out signal, and when the blue light is flashing here, it tells you there's a, so it acts as an alarm, tells you there's another boat around. And these are our YB trackers. So I often keep it up here actually during the risk, it's a better signal if it's in beside. You can see the Echo Max behind with the global ocean globe um, pendant on it. That's the Echo Max that sends out a signal to make me seem as big as a ship. Can it stop me, Schnack? You doing an interview? Yeah. So. So I noticed that you've got um, kind of fold down kind of dodger. Yeah, I wouldn't use a hard dodger. Because Why not? Windage or? Or windage, yeah. It's like having a storm jib in the back of your boat. And just personally, I wouldn't use one. I, I think anyone puts one on is daft. And I thought that before the last race. And that one boat with a hard dodger finished. Until Mark Sinclair came in this year. He had a hard dodger, smaller one. But anyway, yeah, it's just a personal thing. Yeah. So this is my AIS. That sends out the AIS. This is the YB3i, so that's the one that's mainly used. And um, this is my log. You walk it, yeah. You can see I, I, I came all the way in after my 300 mile sail with the log. I was just pulling up and I said, oh, I better pull in my log. You can see it in there, the propeller. The oh, yeah. Yeah. And your self steering system, why have you gone for the. Is it Aries? Yeah. The air is way more powerful than the. The hydrogen, yeah. and because my rudder is so far aft, it really works well. Now it has the ropes that you have to maintain. It has these ropes that the areas are simp or the the hydrogen is simpler, but the the areas is way ahead of it in in power. And that's yeah. So these see that um, chain plate sticking up over here. I have two running backstays. You can see this here. So when I get to the Southern Ocean, I'll have to use them. Yeah, and are you yeah. going for warps or drogue or a combination of the two? Hopefully not. I think they're more trouble than they're worth. I don't think to add to safety. Okay. A lot of boats got in trouble with them the last thing. And personally, I wouldn't use them. So um, you're going for what, warps or no? No, 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 no. just nothing at all. No. See the mast ladder, fantastic oh, system. Yes? I can use that as a as a, a drogue if I want to tow it, but um, I hope I won't have to. They cause a lot of trouble. Yeah. Like, as a trawler, I, I trawl. Uh, if you have, like, the amount of gear you'd have out behind you, you'd think with that, as a draw, I, like, the doors would be two tons each and kites, and the boat will still snake along. Like, if you have something torn behind you and it starts going along like a snake, it's not really as effective as you think. Can we look up the top there and go up yep. the bow? It's a little crowded. <laughs> And it's Tarshiv! <laughs> <laughs> Obviously lots of the contestants have their uh, skippers have their families here and friends to say goodbye to them and because they'll be leaving in a couple of days. So you've got three furlers there, Pat. Yep. And why did you did you choose that did the boat come with it or did you No, I no? put in the Solent, that's the only extra. Okay, and why go for three furlers as opposed to having some with hanked on sails? I had a hang down one there and I found it awkward to, to work. I'd gone up and deck in bad weather and I just decided I know it's a trade off because I will be slower um, going upwind because I have the extra windage. But then downwind and it's a downwind race, I will have way more control and quicker control. So, yeah, that's why I went. And, 
and obviously your ladder, your your ladder there up the mast. Yeah. So you're gonna you could use that as you say an alternatively kind of like a warp in bad weather. Yeah. It's but also I guess I guess it's an extra security feature. If you get knocked down, then you've got extra stuff to hang on to. I guess. Oh well, the ladder comes off. Okay. Yeah, you see it here. Um, it goes up the main sail track. Okay. See the track here. Yep. So it's just these fit into the track there, and they slide up. So it's on the main halyard now. So I'll take it down, store it away, and pull up the main. You can You couldn't sail with it up. And um, so I have to go up and sort out Spinnaker halyard. That's my last job to do. And it's intent to rub off the furler above. So I'll I'll try and put out another block to starboard and seize it on and hopefully that will do and I'll leave the old block up and I'll put a light wind light see that blue rope I'll put that through it and it'll be a spare halyard today if I need a, another halyard we can put it up <laughs> more West Kerry people <laughs> <laughs> well good luck Pat I hope it goes well thank you Katie thank Take you care. so much